Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast with me, James Dixon, wishing you all a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever or wherever you join today's podcast from. The first thing that I do at the top of all of our podcasts is give some context as to when we are recording this, because such is the way that we consume digital media nowadays. People could be listening to this in days, months, weeks, and even years further down the line. So um, today is Friday the 19th of January, 2024. And for me, what could be a slightly different and, if I'm being brutally honest, a daunting podcast experience. Um, I'm stepping a little bit into the unknown today and regular viewers and watchers of the podcast may have even noticed a subtle difference already just with the way that today's podcast began. Usually you would see just myself on screen doing this sort of introduction, introductory ramble um, before welcoming our guest. As eagle-eyed viewers will have already spotted, we have some British Sign Language interpreters on the screen today. That's because the subject of today's podcast is very much geared around the theme of inclusivity. And my guests today, or certainly one of my guests, requires the use of uh, an interpreter in order to facilitate this conversation. This is something that I've had some personal experience with, albeit in a slightly removed fashion in a live events environment, where some of the sessions that we have facilitated at Event Tech Live and Event Sustainability Live have had guests and presenters that require the use of an interpreter. Um, but this is the first time that I've done it using the video platform that we use to record this podcast. And we're doing this today for a number of reasons. A, you know, we want to have these conversations. We've had a number of inclusivity conversations on the podcast over the last couple of years. But B, we also want to show people that if you are feeling a little bit daunted like me, really, there's only one way to approach this. That's to step into the unknown, give it a try, work with good people, and, uh, and, and hopefully... For the betterment of everybody that's involved um we've had a great conversation off camera and off prior to the recording this morning with both of my guests and the two interpreters that you can see on screen so i already know that we've got loads to talk about and it's going to be something that's really interesting hopefully for people to watch and listen to the content so let's get on with some introductions i'm delighted to say that joining us today my first guest is ashley kendall ashley is the director of business development at Sorensen communications and alongside ashley is andrew dewey i'm right in saying that is it, it is dewey andrew um Sorensen from Sorensen communications ably joined by Edward and Darren, our British Sign Language interpreters. Good morning to you all and thank you for joining us. Ashley, if we may start with you first of all, before we get into the nature and the topic of the conversation today, you are Head of Business Development at Sorenton Communications. Could you give our podcast watchers today a little bit of an overview of your career and how it's led you to where you are today? So I'm the Director of International Business Development. And so my career started with community development, communication development, and also looking at growth and development. And the reason I'm really uh, interested and in being here is that I've seen deaf people really interested in being in different businesses and entertainment events, but very often, access is limited and there is so much that we can do to ensure that deaf people can access events and that's where Sorensen comes in and that's where my career in Sorensen has come in that I'm now responsible for international development and I'm looking at Sorensen's products and we have a fantastic range of uh, products with remote interpreting, VRS interpreting, that's video relay uh, interpreting but also we have face-to-face -face interpreting and then I can see the deaf community's needs and I can see how businesses can use these to provide access to the deaf communities who want to uh, interact with them and so I look at community organizations and government um, and businesses in order to ensure that funding is in place then to uh, to provide this access 
and that communication happens both ways. So that's my mission. Fantastic. And Andrew, if we can move on to you again, same question, your career pathway and how it brings you to being in the seat that you're in today. Yeah, thank you, James. And thank you for inviting us on to the podcast this morning. Um, I started my career as a sign language interpreter, um, dare I say, more than 30 years ago. I started out when we didn't really have any laws that kind of encouraged accessibility, such as the Dis Disability Discrimination Act and so on. So interpreting um, you know, hasn't been here forever. It's still a relatively a new thing, although we now can look back a number of decades, it's still needing to take deep root and hold within our day-to-day -day lives. And when we talk about accessibility, um, I started out as a sign language interpreter and thought there are so many barriers here in terms of um, deaf sign language users being able to access events and other things like healthcare education. So I set up a organization, I found an organization called Sign Language Interactions and, and then went on and became the CEO of Interpreter Now, Sign Video, those companies wrapped up into what is today Sonson uh, Communications. Um, Sonson is a worldwide communication provider of services for deaf and hard of hearing people and uh, the UK is a, a place where we've got a heritage uh, of delivering services and uh, hopefully during this conversation we can talk about some of the good practice that I've experienced and seen over the years but also some of the areas where we can make some transformational improvements. Mm. And when we were talking off air prior to, to hitting the big record button uh, this morning. You, 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 I know that you mentioned, you know, there are examples from the 90s that we could go back and reference. But from my, my own personal experience, if it helps today's conversation, I was born in 1980. And the only time I can recall seeing and experiencing sign language of any description was usually very late at night on BBC Two, there'd be repeats of certain programs where they would show a selection of programming with a, 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 a sign language interpreter in the corner of the screen. And really, aside from that, when I was growing up, I can't recall ever really experiencing a, a prevalence um, and a significant you know, undertaking of sign language. How far forward have we genuinely stepped, not just in the event space, and we'll get to that, Ashley, but in society as a whole, have we made huge leaps forward? Or is sign language interpretation, as an example, really something that is still regarded as quite niche and, you know, something that people book for a specific purpose? Hmm. Well, if we think about in the 60s, the deaf community at that point was, well, they, they saw the problem as being themselves, that sign language was the barrier, but they owned that problem. However, during the 70s, that changed and deaf people started to become more active and there were campaigns to change this. And there were a number of breakthroughs. And so slowly we have seen change. In the 80s, late 70s, 80s, we started to see, as you said, uh, interpreters on television, but also deaf programs on television. So seeing deaf people actually on television using sign language. And there's been a slow evolution and change since then. So I think in summary, access and sign language really has uh, improved enormously, partly because the government in 2003 recognized legally, um, uh, in 2022, again, that um, sign language is a, um, a language and recognized it as an official language of the UK. And we've been campaigning for that for years. But that actual legislation is only very recent. But of course, we're not satisfied at this point because this is that there is so much still to change and there is a lot more that we need to do and a lot that we want to see come. Now, focusing on interpreting, I'd say in the 90s, the number of interpreters, sign language interpreters, very, very slowly started to grow. And so we have a lot more interpreters now than we used to. And we then had something called Access to Work, which is a government grant, 
which supports deaf people in workplaces. So deaf people can book interpreters themselves so that they can work in uh, any career they want to. And of course, a number of interpreters then are going to be working in that space. But then, of course, we don't have enough interpreters again because deaf people are using the interpreters that are there, which is where video interpreting comes in. Because then we can, and there are other reasons too, but then we can share the resources we have and provide access to a lot more deaf people. Now, I'm a deaf parent myself. And if I think about my child's experience and my own experience, of course, there's much more access now, but it's nowhere near 100%. It's not even 50% yet. Um, but it is better than it was, absolutely. There are two questions that spring to mind um, from that, Ashley. The first relates to um, interpreters, and you, you referenced there that the, the more we use companies like Sorensen and the more people decide that they have to be inclusive and they have to offer a service, then their place is a bigger demand on the interpretation network that you have of, of, of interpreters. Mm -hmm. This may be a, a naive or an even an ignorant question, but would I be right in saying that in decades past, people who were fluent in British Sign Language were so because they had a reason to be so, because they had a family member or somebody close to them who was deaf and that that's how they... they came to learn the language mm -hmm. are we at a stage now where that's still very much the case or do people learn british sign language because there are career paths because it's a viable form of study in the same way somebody would go to university and study french or latin yeah james i'm happy to take that question i think exactly. you're, you're spot on um historically you would maybe have a family member who is deaf so you would learn sign language however today probably most people who train and qualify as a sign language interpreter will go through um an, an academic route or a vocational route we have a number of interpreting providers um, across the uk from wolverhampton university to harriet watt university and other providers and so there are more pathways to becoming a qualified sign language interpreter there. And I'm glad you raised the point about having language fluency um, <clears throat> contrasted with being a qualified sign language interpreter. And I think that's an important point to highlight with your listeners that um, when thinking about arranging an event, and, and the title of this podcast is, we, we came up with, didn't we, make this a first thought rather than the last thought. Because when it's the last thought, you're going to be struggling to um, be able to book the right team of people that can support your event so it can be successful. And, and so it's about ensuring that you use a qualified interpreter. Most interpreters in the UK are registered with a body called um, the called NRCPD, um, which is the professional body for sign language interpreters. And there are you, you want to ensure that you're using a reputable interpreter or organization that can support you um, with your event. I think the other point I would stress is it's not just about requesting interpreters about the preparation of actually looking at your overall event and from start to finish, how can you make sure that that journey works smoothly um, so that somebody who is attending, who is a native sign language user, um, has the same experience as Andrew Dewey, a hearing person, or as James walking through that event. And I think that's the, the vision. That, that's kind of where we hope this message today will, will hit across the sector. Mm. Can I come in there, James? Yeah. I'd just like to add to say when we're talking about the event and we're thinking about then contact and make booking tickets and so on, when we're thinking about the podcast, for example, you need to think about time. So if we're booking interpreters, you're not going to be able to book an interpreter for an event tomorrow, or certainly not very easily. What you want is to ensure that you have sufficient time to make sure that you have the interpreters available that you need to. We do have interpreters across the UK. Uh, there's about uh, a thousand and a half interpreters. 
Um, but with availability can be a, uh, an issue. So booking well in advance when you can, but then also taking time to ensure the interpreters are prepared properly, depending on your event. They may need to have the notes of presentations. Um, if it's a concert, for example, they're going to need time to rehearse the lyrics well before your event. So things like that take time. And that's why we want it to be a first thought about providing access in BSL. And if you're offering me the opportunity to let you know from the start that I need BSL access, that, that gives you the uh, time as an organizer to put these things in place. Does it help that uh, the video platforms, for example, that we're using today are so much more accessible to people? When we talk about um, uh, the pool of interpreters that you have available, mm. travel is clearly going to play a big part of um, that availability. If they've got to travel from London to Manchester, for example, or to other parts of the country to get to an event or further afield, um, that's time when they could be translating that they're in fact traveling. Does video technology play a bigger part in how we bring this into the mainstream event world? Um, technology certainly has been a, a lever to broaden out um, accessibility. Um, looking in other sectors where interpreting services and other communication services are provided, um, it just gives parity with hearing people, um, such as now, if you want to say contact your GP, you would have to call up on a uh, on the phone to make that appointment. If you're a deaf sign language user, how do you do that? You immediately face a barrier. And so technology has been a real game changer in that now deaf people can make an appointment with their GP or anybody else they want to contact, or if even booking a ticket for an event. You know, if you have to call up the, the event office on a phone, that's great if your hearing can speak, but what about if you're deaf and use sign language? Well, now through this medium, you can go through a sign language interpreter and they can interpret that call. So um, it's radically um, moved the dial in terms of access. However, we always need to be careful that as good as technology is, there are points where there are still, we still need in-person people. So you might have an event and think, great, we're going to use technology, but it's really important that you speak with the professionals that are supporting you because they may say, no, actually, um, we need to be there in person because of the, the layout, the, uh, the sound and all of those other things. And, uh, and so that's why it's really important that before any event that you contract, whether it be with Swanson Communications or any other um, communication provider, and talk through the steps. Um, as I say, I started out in this field 30 years ago, and if I could just share this brief story with you, uh, James, in 1998, okay, there was a really famous guild band called the Spice Guilds, and um, I uh, was in my office, and we had a call from the Spice Guilds agents asking, could we go and interpret for their UK-wide tour? Now, this is probably one of the first breakthrough in events of having the Spy Skills UK tour interpreted at every arena, arena tour. Now, there was a lot of excitement, as you can appreciate. How do you approach something of that scale so that um, the deaf community could go and have that real experience? And so with what technology we did have back then, we managed to set it up in the the interpreter was backstage, filmed, it was broadcasted on screens, and it was very successful. I have to say that I had another colleague, which was a bigger Spice Girls fan. So although the request came to me, I thought, hmm, I'm probably, as if nobody, if my colleague can't do it, then I'll be up on the stage and I'll do it. But I thought, you know what, I've got another colleague who's professional, is more artistic in that way, and I said, you go do it. And he went and covered all of the arena shows. And so again, I just highlight the point that sometimes you may have a qualified silent interpreter, but that might not mean that they are the best fit for it. And any professional interpreter or 
provider of services would be able to help guide you through that process. Because when you're putting on an arena tour, a Glastonbury, um, a political event, um, you don't want to have any uh, embarrassing situations. And it, it would be important, and, it, and we're 20 minutes in and not mention the subject of sustainability, because in the events industry, there is a huge com ongoing conversation about how we make events sustainable. And in wider business, there is a conversation about how businesses make themselves more sustainable. And the one thing that has been commonly agreed on in the conversations that I've had both at events and on this podcast is that we have been misled by the term sustainability and sustainable into thinking that this means getting people on public transport instead of driving. It means recycling coffee cups. It means using less paper. It's not just about the recycling and, and green and carbon footprint. Sustainable means that you have a sustainable business practice when it comes to the welfare of your staff, to your ongoing development of your teams. Um, sustainable means inclusivity as well. And a sustainable event is not just one that recycles its, its coffee cups and its plates, but a sustainable <coughs> event is one that offers inclusivity to everybody wherever possible because by definition that will make it more sustainable because it's bringing more people in is that a conversation Ashley that you have had with people on the subjects of sustainability and their misunderstanding and misinterpretation of that particular word hmm. you're absolutely right James quite often the conversation we have with other organizations I can see that I have a different perspective on sustainability. I'm looking, for example, at brand protection. I'm thinking about those organizations and they have huge brands. They have events where they highlight their brand. And of course, they're very protective of their brand and what it means. And their brand means they need to do the right thing for their brand so the brand is represented well so when they have events and people go to those events they want to make sure that everything they do everything they do links to inclusion and accessibility ensuring that people from different languages can access that and so when i raise this in the conversation quite often i'm saying to you i'm saying to that organization this is what we can do to help you protect your brand and let me give you one example. Some time ago, we had a concert in Belfast. I'm trying to remember the name of the band. I can't remember the band, but not to worry. Unfortunately, they denied and refused to provide sign language interpreting for two deaf people who wanted to go to the concert. And they had awful news coverage sustained negative news coverage and of course it was really disappointing both for the deaf people who wanted to see their favorite band but also it damaged that band's reputation and if they'd got it right in the first place everything would have been well everything would have gone well and their brand would have been enhanced not diminished and so that is the conversation we need to talk about uh, about getting it right in the first place. Andrew, is this is that example related to short-sighted business decisions based on cost, where you'll present the cost of this service to a client or to a potential client, and they'll say, hmm, we haven't really factored it into the budget this year for our event, so this is an additional cost. And, and is there a short-sightedness within the business decisions being made by people in the event space and in other sectors? It is. Um, and cost can be a factor. However, for many organisations, the cost isn't the issue. It's the, the lack of um, thinking through the sustainability angle of it. Um, there'll always be smaller companies that are struggling financially to survive. And that's when you have to think about, well, what can we do to support those businesses, those sectors? Because um, we need to find a, a compromise of how we can work together so that 
that group of organizations can still have accessibility. But there are many other businesses, government sectors and so on that um, will have examples of good practice, but not across the whole range of their activity. And that is short sighted. Um, when we think about um, today's social topics, whether it be one of the COP events, whether it be in a political setting, um, technology event, charity event, if we can mainstream what we do, then they'll, pe people in society will feel less um, disenfranchised or, or um, marginalized. And so this is what we want to do is not just think about, let's make sure we've got two interpreters and captioning at the event, but on the website, have um, communication in sign language and about how to contact us. On social media, put out information so that deaf people aren't having to check and do all the hard work of having to find out, well, if I go, will there be a sign language interpreter? Will there be captions? What um, people who are uh, sign language users or hard of hearing want to do is to think, well, I'm free on Saturday. I see there's a great event on in the local arena. I'm just gonna go and I've got a ticket and I'm gonna go around the stalls I'm going to interact and I'll be able to do that just like my neighbor who's going. Please, Ashley. Thanks, James. If I can just add there that when we're talking about sustainability, you need organizations need to look into how they're going to do this, how they're going to be inclusive and provide sign language access, because often people and organizations want to decide what is best for deaf people. And actually it's much better to talk to deaf people and deaf community about what would work for us. Have a conversation with us. We will help educate you as to what you need to do. You know, deaf people aren't all the same. One size doesn't fit all. We have different needs. And so you, have a, you want to have a number of tools ready so that when a deaf person has a request, you're ready to say, OK, this is what we can do. If a deaf person, and I am uh, an example of this, is a sign language user from a deaf family, then I'm going to want an interpreter. But there are other deaf people. So, for example, I've got a good friend who has excellent English skills and they'd prefer to watch captions. And that's fine. Some deaf people have different levels of hearing. So some people like me can't hear anything at all. Other people may have some hearing loss, but actually they may be able to speak for themselves, but not be able to hear. So again, they might rely on captions. So when we talk about deafness, we're not talking about one thing. And what you need to do is talk to deaf people, talk to the customer, talk to the community and say, what is it that you need for this event in this situation? And I see that again as part of sustainability that you're providing what people need, not what you think they need. This is a question for both of you. So Ashley and Andrew, feel free to raise your hand as to, to whoever wants to go first. But I've, I've heard conversations with organizers before whereby they've been presented with costs associated with bringing in interpretation. And they've said, well, hmm, it's a big cost for what will be a very, 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 very mi minor element of our audience. We're willing to, you know, okay, it might upset one or two people. Are they missing the fact that by actively publicizing um, their commitment to bringing in interpretation of any form, it could be closed captions, or it could be uh, BSL interpreters, it could be both, that actually they're potentially attracting a larger audience who thus far haven't come to their event because they feel prohibited from doing so. Yeah, I, I, I think the business case, when you look at the business case, if you look at it from a purely financial perspective, they may say, well, the expenditure um, it outweighs what the return may be. Now, is that how we want to care for, treat people in society today, um, when really we are looking at how can we provide equality for all, all people. 
Now, the other angle is that there is a huge market out there of people that want to spend their money and to attend. And so the more that events organizations, events organizers can promote what they're doing, that it's accessible, then they're going to attract more people to their events that will spend money. But if, if it's only ad hoc, if we only do it in an ad hoc way, then potentially the financial return will be tricky. But if we make it the norm, then that will develop and we will see more people engaged and spending their, their pounds with events. Mm. And if I can just add to that, James. When I see any large event, if you think about the annual budget, just at the beginning, include costs for accessibility. Just at the start of your planning, it's really hard to measure how much that should be, but put something in there, estimate, guesstimate, and include that from the very start when you're setting up the budget. So you're not in that position of going, oh dear, we didn't have a budget for accessibility. So, and all of a sudden you're saying to the deaf or disabled person, this is your problem. Actually, no, make it your issue, plan it in, and then it becomes easy. If we look at how change can be made and shaped and we look at two elements of the events industry let's look at the exhibition industry the trade show market and we look at the live music sector of the events industry in both of those markets there are a number of big players if you look in the live music uh, world there are two or three major global promoters and brands that you know hold most of the, the big marketplace of the, the global superstars and their concert tours, festivals, live performances. Similarly, in the exhibition and trade show sector, there are a number of big companies that control hundreds, if not thousands of shows of that nature. Should we be looking at those big organizations in both of those marketplaces to make a commitment to this so that change filters down because particularly in the music industry, smaller venues, smaller bands, you know, smaller record labels are often shaped and influenced by what's being done by the bigger artists and the bigger organizations. I definitely, I think looking at this <clears throat> more strategically is definitely the, the right approach and it allows for more sustainability and uniformity in how we do things. Um, because right now it's just very much hit and miss and it feeds into other things as well James when you can look at how we could do this strategically so if there is uh, if there are certain groups that have got funding that are the the main um, organizers they can then work with companies that are the suppliers to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible um, because there is an efficiency sometimes um, and we don't want to see waste of, of funds and so on. But also it can help with the training of professionals to work in those settings. Because suddenly if next week every single event wants to have sign language interpreters captioning, then I imagine that the industry would be overwhelmed with the demand because the, the resource is growing, but it still this, we still don't have sufficient sign language interpreters. And so working strategically means that you can look at the, the demands on funding, the um, building capacity within the workforce, and ultimately to make sure that the, the reason for doing this, that we, we achieve it, and it's not just a tick box. The last thing we want is for this to be a tick box um people um whether it be hearing or deaf um have the right and should be able to access what's going on um in a similar way hmm. and it strikes me that there is a an imbalance uh, my late mum was a, a wheelchair user she suffered she had multiple sclerosis and was diagnosed with that in the mid 80s when i was still still a boy and so I remember, you know, I, I grew up with a mum who was, a, who was a wheelchair user. And at that time, I, I remember, you know, 
too numerous to mention I- examples of of where she couldn't access somewhere or would be playing you know football on a Sunday morning and she couldn't actually get to you know get get to the place that we were playing in. Um, we've we've moved on massively in terms of physical disability access. So if somebody tries to get into an event space now, whether that be a, a trade show, a, a sort of congress hall, or a, a live entertainment venue, you can rest assured there will be wheelchair access. Even if there is one wheelchair <coughs> user that turns up at your event, there will be wheelchair access for them. I, is there actually a discrimination within the disability spectrum at the moment? <coughs> James, you've highlighted something here which um, is quite key. The reason why there is much better physical access today is because of laws that have been passed. You know, building laws, building regulations, um, these laws have been in place for some time and now organisations would be in breach of the law if they didn't make this available. Um, we're still in the position, and maybe Ashley can talk a little bit more about how the British Sign Language laws um, have been put in place and what they can mm. and can't do. Yeah. Another thing before we go on is, of course, that deafness is a hidden disability. Because you, if you look at me, I, I walk, okay? I don't look deaf. And that is another factor, which is that as a group who looks okay, you can be sidelined, I think. You mentioned earlier, or I mentioned earlier, the BSL Act, which was recently passed. And we were really, uh, really excited to see this enacted into legislation. But the legislation isn't yet carrying any enforcement we have a BSL board, a British Sign Language board, and that board is looking at different departments in government and discussing with them, making changes over the years to strengthen the laws. Because the BSL Act itself needs to then connect with other legislation, for example, around education, accessibility, and so on. At the moment, our protection is the Equality Act 2010 and the BSL Act 2023. So in terms of what you can and can't do, I think it's still too early to say that in a legal perspective, but I would like to share some of my personal experiences perhaps, if that's okay, James. Okay, perfect. So as I said, I grew up as a deaf uh, person using sign language. I don't hear anything that I didn't use speech at that time. And, you know, I love being part of the deaf community. I love being part of deaf culture. I didn't feel sorry for myself. And I only felt disabled when society made me disabled. So quite often growing up, and of course deaf people and I go to events. That may surprise some of you, but we do like to go to events. And I might want to go to a concert. Even though I'm deaf, I enjoy seeing the experience of a concert with a sign language interpreter. I go to festivals. And there are often barriers. Now, I love wine. And recently I went to a wine festival and I was absolutely gutted that they refused to provide an inter sign language interpreter. I let them know in good time. They just kept saying we can't. So in the end, I thought I, I still want to be there. Uh, and so I went. And I did enjoy tasting the wine, but all the presentations, I had no access to it. I tried to lip read and it was so tiring. And the winemakers themselves were fantastic trying to have conversations with me. And they would give me tasting notes, but of course they couldn't communicate with me. It wasn't their fault, but the event organizer hadn't met my needs or their needs to be able to communicate with me. And even though I had to pay full price for that, I got zero access. I just wandered around looking at bottles and labels. Is that really acceptable now? Of course it isn't. I go to football matches and I watch the games. And obviously the game itself is self-explanatory. 
But sometimes, perhaps at half time, there'll be commentary continuing and I don't get access to that. I don't understand the perspectives that are being shared. You know, this is about my daily life growing up and not having access and having to kind of accept the barriers that are being imposed on me and asking and being told no repeatedly is really disheartening. I think it's about time for you to give me a yes, for the industry to give me a yes when I ask for something. There are the tools, there are the interpreters, there are the products, they already exist. I just need your commitment to say yes. That's the final step, but only you can make that change. And I think as was highlighted by the example you gave with the band over in Belfast, I think you said, that their refusal to adopt it had so much a bigger negative impact than the positive impact they would have received had they actually not even taken the plunge, just said yes. It's no longer about taking the plunge anymore or stepping into the unknown. As hopefully we are highlighting today on the podcast, services are available. Companies like Sorensen are there to assist with event organisers and provide them with solutions and options. Um, and there is not a one size fits all approach is what I'm taking away from from this conversation today. No, and absolutely. It, it's really important that people have the conversation. I know that that's kind of you know, there's a slight irony in saying that, um, it, given the subject of today's podcast, but have the conversation with people um, and start talking and, and get ideas from other mm. people. We've done that in all the other aspects of planning and running events, whether that be AV, the technology that we use to help shape and plan them, the registration systems that we use at trade shows, you know, all of these methods of transport, every other element, we would call in experts and we would sit down with them and say, what's your advice? How can you shape and how can you guide my event? And this strikes me as just another element that we need to bring into our production processes to have these conversations early not just with the end user, the people who will ultimately benefit from the interpreters or the captions, but actually with the companies and the experts who can provide that. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. I, I think that's spot on. I completely agree with that. And that's where we come in. So Sorensen are be a set of experts for whatever sector, whether it's interpreting, face-to-face, -face, remote captioning, the different services, please, if you're not sure, if you're anxious, you want to signpost uh, other people in your organization, just contact us and talk to us. Now, there are four things that we can uh, suggest, I think. First of all, as Andrew said, think about your events journey. Think about from the point of an advert, a deaf person sees an advert right the way to arriving at your venue. How are they going to get access? How are they going to feel included and positive before they get to uh, your venue? So thinking about four examples. So bring sign language interpreters into the event as appropriate. If deaf people want to call the event, if they want to make a booking or to discuss with you about accessibility, think about how they're going to make that call. And that's where you can use Sorensen video relay services. So that's remote interpreting so they can be put through on the phone to one of your um, operators. You need to provide this. Have deaf awareness training organized for your event staff, which means that when I arrive at the event and I say hi, they know what to do. They're not panicking when they meet a deaf person. And lastly, think about your website design. If you have lots and lots of English for deaf people and other second language users, that's not going to be very accessible. Where possible, include some BSL or include some shorter, more straightforward English. So I think there's just four tips to help you give me a positive experience when I want to attend one of your events. Which is an excellent segue into uh, the start of wrapping up today's podcast episode um, by taking that a stage further, Ashley, 
we can go to websites, Andrew. Presumably there are professional groups on LinkedIn. But if, if people want to sort of continue this exploration beyond today's podcast, you work in the event space and you want to find out more about what you do, tell us where they need to go. Presumably website is the best place to start, Andrew. Um, yeah, and um, you're welcome to make contact with Sonson um, at sonson.co.uk. We um, are specialists, but also we work in partnership with many other organisations and, and also with the charity sector where maybe there are other services that other organisations could provide in terms of awareness and support and uh, talking about the, the journey that you're going on. And if you want to learn more about the, um, the qualification of the language interpreter, you can go and look on the professional website, which is NRCPD and, uh, and find out more information. There are that there is, as Ashley mentioned, in Scotland, we have the BSL Act, which has been in place since 2015 in Scotland. And we now have the UK BSL Act, which um, was um, became legislation in 2023. And again, there's narrative around that that can help um, inform people on what what can be done. Excellent. And, I, and James, please, could I just uh, yes. come in there? Thank you. I just wanted to add that you can contact us through Sonson's website, as we've discussed, but you can also contact me or Andrew Dewey through LinkedIn. So Ashley Kendall and Andrew Dewey, you can find us on LinkedIn and Sorensen. Excellent. And um, I, I would be confident in saying that following this podcast today people are going to get in contact this is a subject and a conversation that is becoming more prevalent in the events industry um, certainly I'm in maybe a, a more of a fortunate position a in hosting this podcast and being involved in a, a show that launched last year called event sustainability live where I've been fortunate enough to maybe have more of these conversations than other people that work in the events industry but I think the point of today's podcast was to have, you know, get into the topic and to have these conversations, but also in a more simplistic level to just highlight what we're doing here today. We've been able via the medium of a video platform to have an engaging, insightful, thoughtful, educational two way conversation with people, regardless of their uh, ability and their ability to hear, their ability to, to communicate verbally. And for me, it, I was nervous. I'll be, I'll, I'll, you know, I don't, I'm not ashamed to say I was nervous before today's recording. I hadn't done anything like this before. Um, and if anybody out there working in the event sector has shared a similar thought where they, 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 they're not sure how to approach it, they're not sure how, w w what type of language to use when they are talking to people or trying to have these conversations, it is inevitable that you may make a small mistake. It is inevitable that you might not quite use the right terminology. What is absolutely imperative is that you just start the conversations and speak to people and start finding out how you can implement better accessibility into your events. Um, and I'm really, really grateful to all of my guests today. And I won't just name two guests because in reality we've had four people who've been critical to shaping today's podcast we've had ashley kendall and andrew dewey from Sorensen communications joining us but of course we've been ably assisted by the wonderful edward and darren who've made ultimately today's podcast possible so thank you to all four of you for joining us today and if i may i'm just going to wrap up very quickly by saying that um, if you want to uh, find out a, a little bit more about what's going on in the industry, you are probably watching this on the eventindustrynews.com website already, possibly via our YouTube channel. Um, if, uh, if you're there, please do check out the latest news features and special supplements that are available on event, eventindustrynews.com. Of course, the A to Z supplier directory. If you are looking for a service, a product or a supplier within the events industry, the chances are you will find it within the A to Z supplier directory on the event industry news website 
thank you so much to my guests today. It's um, It's been great. I feel so much more relaxed now at the end of the recording than I did at the start. Thank you. Thank you all for facilitating it and making it such an enjoyable experience. Thank you to everybody for watching this today. Um, and we will see you on the next edition of the Event Industry News Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye now.